think we'll get started. A lot of people here and uh, we expect some others, but uh, we're gonna get started. Thank you for being here. We're so happy to see so many people here. Welcome to Pipe Art, Understudied Glass. We've got a great group of panelists here and I think you're really gonna enjoy the evening. I'm Marjorie Nathanson, the Executive Director of Huntington Art Museum. This program is in conjunction with a wonderful exhibition we have, Glass in the Expanded Field, curated by Caitlin Vitalo. She did a fabulous job. If you haven't seen it, come by because it's really great. It's gonna be up until April uh, 18th. So you've got some time. Um, and there are 17 artists in the show and it really represents the diversity of contemporary glass making. So um, don't miss it. I'd like to thank Basil Bandwagon for funding in part the exhibition and the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, a partner agency of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation for their general operating support. I'm so glad we have this panel tonight. Um, just quickly introduce everybody. Susie Silbert, who's the curator of post-war and contemporary glass at the Corning Museum of Glass. Artist and pipe maker, Dan Coyle. Joseph Larned, Assistant Professor of Art History at Drexel University. Artist and pipe maker known as Salt. Artist pipe make and pipe maker, Kim Thomas. Jason Vardikar, Ham's Curator of Special Projects. And glass artist, Caitlin Vitalo, who is the curator, as I said a minute ago, and also Ham's Education Coordinator. I'm going to turn this over to Jason and uh, enjoy the evening. Thank you, Marjorie, for the kind introductions. And thank you to our audience for being here for the great turnout. Thank you to the panelists, um, Caitlin Vitalo, the curator of the current exhibition, for bringing pipe art to my attention. The three renowned artists, Salt, Dan Coyle, and Kim Thomas, for teaching me so much through, through, through your work. And thank you to Joseph Larnard and Susie Silbert for your friendship and mentorship. We are honored to have all of you with us today on this groundbreaking panel, which is among the first of its kind on the subject. Pipe art, as we shall learn through this symposium, is an art form sometimes demoted as subsculpture by law or public opinion. As such, this symposium is an intervention. We will interweave presentations on pipe art and historical glass both which often are demoted by such hierarchical ways of thinking to explore these understudied cultural histories of the United States. I would like to open the door to this rich topic just very briefly today um, by way of a personal reflection on this particular glass object on the screen. Made in New Jersey circa 1830, now preserved in the collection of the Winter Tour Museum, this sugar bowl, to my knowledge, has not been the subject of scholarly attention. But to me, this covered sugar bowl suggests a human body. The glass blower stacked ruby bubbles of glass vertically, making this supple and anthropomorphic shape. The middle levels like rolls of fat Folds of flesh suggest a torso. The two applied handles like arms with elbows out and hands at the hip. The round cover or lid of the sugar bowl may be like a head, the drips of glass like a mop of hair, the bird finial on top like a couture hat. The humanoid form may even appear to slouch slightly, leaning as if to relax into its right side. Perhaps the shining surface seems to sweat. These anthropomorphisms may be my own project projections because it is true that I go to the sugar bowl with my imagined body. I imagine my body around it, using it, having perhaps a sensuous experience. I imagine lifting the lid by the bird finial, my thumb, pointer, and middle fingers clasping as I place it aside. Inside, the sh a sugar spoon chimes along the edge. I shovel out crystals of sugar and dip it into a teacup. The sugar stirs in the hot tea, 
a ceremony presided over by this work of glass, this double of my body on the table. I imagine lifting the teacup to my mouth, parted lips sipping the sucker in my gums, the embouchure of steam, the heat in the throat, the tickle of swallowing. Perhaps the form of the sugar bowl itself gestures to such bodily acts of pleasure. Without the lid, it might evoke a set of puckering crimson wet lips. Inside of the bowl, the hollow cavity of juicy red glass might evoke the inside of the throat, intestines, the body in many ways. Made in New Jersey in 1830 by an anonymous glass blower, we might also imagine the exquisitely embodied act of producing this work. To make each curved level of the sugar bowl, a glass blower exhaled through a hollow metal tube, causing a ball of glass to inflate like an opening lung. Each hollow is a print, as it were, of the glass blower's lung. They pooled with tongs to make the drips that are sometimes called lily pads, leaving grooves within some of the drips for us to trace the pressure they applied with their hand tool. To make the bird finial, they pinched out the tail, they pulled delicately to extend the neck and beak. So many quick and subtle movements of the mouth, hands and fingers. Bodily gestures 200 years old, still visible. The form thereby is a textbook work of craft, engaging the depth of connection between the body of the maker and the object made. The art historian Julia Bryan Wilson has argued that one way to think about craft is through the lens of queerness. Bryan Wilson writes, quote, craft objects like queer desires are multiple, crossing beyond the high-low divide. They are props, they are surrogates, they are functional, they are decorative, they are frivolous, and they are usable. Mostly, they refuse to be any one thing, end quote. I would push too far Brian Wilson's argument about craft if I were to suggest that this 1830s work somehow anachronistically embraces queer desire. Nonetheless, I will repeat a version of Brian Wilson's explanation of craft through the lens of queerness, but now turned to this object. Crossing the high-low divide, the sugar bowl is utilitarian, but invites ceremony. It is a prop for a performative and uncommon tea time. It is a surrogate for the body. It is a special decoration as well as a useful object. It evokes the pleasure of eating, drinking, glass making. And finally, it rejoices in the lowness of the quotidian act of storing and using sugar. It refuses to be any one thing. Indeed, this is a special sugar bowl, so bodily, it evokes the multiple desires of life. So that's, thank you, that's my introduction. And um, I'd like to turn it over to our first artist now, um, Luke and Chief, who goes by Salt. First of all, I wanted to say thank you really quick for um, getting to be a part of this. Thank you to the Hunter Dunn. Um, and uh, thank you to Jason for that introduction. Uh, and I, wow, that was quite poetic. I'm gonna try to follow that up here. Um, so I'm just gonna move it right along. So this is my first slide. Um, and this is a, what's called a dry piece uh, and it's made with borosilicate glass. So just a little bit of background about the material. Uh, there are different types of glass uh, and they're used for different, you know, they're designed and used for different types of things. And one of the characteristics of borosilicate glass is that it's, it's very durable uh, and it has a lower coefficient of expansion, which basically without getting too technical, that translates to being able to make smaller and more detailed things and so it lends itself to this uh, realm that we call functional glass and the pipe uh, neatly falls into that category. And so what you're looking at here is a pipe that is meant to be used without water, hence the term dry piece. Um, and so from uh, inspirationally, I have always been drawn to life. And so you'll see the features of life throughout my work 
Um, but like life uh, in in its environment, it is always like affected by what's going on around it. And so early on, I realized that um, there were things about pipe art that were unique. Um, and one of them Jason touched on, which is that it is not viewed as um, strictly as art necessarily, uh, and or not even legal in some contexts. And so my uh, earliest pipes especially began with this sort of sense of camouflage and to have these features like teeth and armor, uh, claws, uh, these features that are associated in the animal world with uh, self-defense and to and protection. And so <clears throat> a salt pipe doesn't necessarily look like a pipe, um, especially my earliest work. And that's designed to protect the pipe and protect the user from situations where it would be in implied danger. Um, and so you'll see some of that in uh, this piece, but also throughout, let's see. So this next slide shows um, a grouping of work. Everything is, is kind of using the same color theme. And I just, I think these pieces like look nice together, but what this illustrates is this, uh, this theme of life carries with it the idea of evolution and so you're looking at work here that spans about seven years or so, and things get more and more complicated as I followed the medium and I followed uh, the aesthetics that I was drawn to. And some of these pieces are rather large. The, the piece on the right is about 16 inches tall. Uh, and this, this larger piece on the left with the open mouth is uh, you know a little shorter, but weighs probably four or five pounds. It represents like one of the larger things that I've ever made. Um, and the idea being that I'm trying to immerse myself in these ideas of the of my pieces being alive and the environment that they are coming from, in order to enrich the work itself and try to make the work better by by sort of continuing to tell myself this story of what's behind the work and allow that to infuse uh, into what I'm making. And so, let's move right along here. Okay, so this is a little bit more current. Um, and I included this piece because it demonstrates um, some of the necessities that are involved with making what we would call functional art. But really what that is dealing with is the fact that these, these pieces are meant to be used. And so there are uh, ways of problem solving uh, that pre-existed and were sort of borrowed from what's called scientific glass. And that's that deals with like uh, chemistry and uh, certain types of apparatus where you're moving liquids or vapors. And so, some of that was borrowed in early pipe making in order to uh, to solve some of these problems. Uh, one of the most basic of which is that something up here, this is sort of the beginning of where this process starts. This is called a joint. Um, the material is either burned or vaporized. It needs to travel through uh, some kind of downstem is what it's referred to, to the bottom of the piece where the water is kept. And so what I've done here is innovated a way to solve that problem that allows me to maintain my aesthetic throughout the object. Um, and so this is actually carved in to the side of this vessel. And then I used a tungsten pick to uh, create a couple of holes right here. This is, this is obviously two different angles of the same piece in case that wasn't clear. Um, and then I covered that channel with a transparent uh, stringer of glass until it was completely um, covered over and melted it smooth, thus creating a channel in the side of the piece and, and solving the problem in a way that is not only, I guess, more durable and more um, ready for what I'm going to do to it aesthetically, but it, it also becomes part of the aesthetic of the piece. And I found that um, besides these preconceived notions about pipes, that pipe art is also experienced in a different way, um, that rather than being 
put behind the stanchion and hung on the wall and sort of protected the way that art is traditionally treated in, in an effort to protect the art, pipe art is meant to be touched and meant to be shared in this different way. Um, people sit down in groups and they bring their pieces together and they, they hand them to each other and they breathe through them and they listen to the way that they sound and they touch them and they clean, I mean, they treat them almost as pets because you're sort of, you have to take care of this object very carefully and clean it and, um, and sort of a lot of people travel with them. So I, I kind of realized in the middle of my journey that these things were so unique to pipe making, but also they were an opportunity, a, an invitation into this ritual and this more um, intimate experience. And so I include a lot of textures with my work uh, that I know are going to be touched and, and sort of, you know, experienced in this more sensual way. And so you'll see that on this piece, but really on everything. Um, and <clears throat> moving along, this is something that I made with another artist. His name is Scott Tribble. Um, and he goes by Skaz. That's like his, his pipe making name. Uh, and so obviously there's a ton of teeth uh, featured on this piece, but one of the, also one of the more striking things about this particular object is its scale. This is about the size and, and uh, dimensions of a basketball. So for us, that is a rather large object uh, and requires, uh, there's a lot of components coming together and a lot of steps and, you know, a lot of sort of like figuring out the order of operations in order to make all this work and come together. And it does also extenuate and, and kind of highlight some of these particular working characteristics of our material borosilicate glass uh, because that low coefficient of expansion allows for what is referred to as thermal elasticity and that basically means having one part of the object very hot like working temperature while other parts of the object may cool down all the way to room temperature and so a lot of what's going on here is made possible by the medium um, and then you know to highlight the teeth themselves Again, this is sort of, for me, I'm drawn to these uh, aspects of life, especially the eyes and the teeth. But I think the teeth are something that also kind of plays into this idea that, that pipes have been looked at as less than legal, less than art. And so what I'm trying to do here is suggest that this object is capable of defending itself um, metaphorically, but also that it's you know, the teeth are compelling. People want to look at it, I think. And, uh, and so I enjoy playing with those ideas and, and sort of taking them. Uh, this, this is an example of like really taking that idea pretty far. Uh, there's like something like 256 teeth on this one. And so, okay, next um, is uh, an object that I call the um, uh, empathic dagger. Okay, and so this is, for me, this piece was a cathartic um, experience. Um, and so to, to try to like be as brief as possible, this piece was inspired by the events surrounding the death of George Floyd. And I was, you know, along with uh, so many people sort of watching these things unfold and feeling very helpless uh, and there was a lot of confusion and I just decided that uh, or really I remembered that the most powerful thing I could do was to put these thoughts and ideas into a piece of art and so I created this dagger which does also happen to be a pipe um, but the point of this is that in using it if if you were to use it for destruction then you would have to pay a price uh, by uh, the, the teeth that are built into the handle would be biting into your hand, essentially. And the idea being that in order to cause harm, you would be causing harm to yourself. Um, and, you know, basically just trying to point out that with empathy that and maybe some some kind of um, moment of thoughtfulness that maybe we could avoid these situations where we are hurting each other 
or lashing out at each other, whether that's physically or uh, in a political st or in an ideological stance. And, um, and you know, the, the piece itself for me became kind of how I dealt with the issue. It helped me clarify what I was thinking and to try to do something to, um, you know, some kind of effort to make a statement, make a difference. All right, right along. Oh, that's it. That was my last slide. <laughs> so uh, I will now pass it off to Dan Coyle, my friend and colleague. So thank you, Lucan. You've always been a big inspiration to me and glad that you're my friend and you always have such a great way of, of uh, dictating and telling people what's up. But I saw something in the comments and, and somebody, uh, somebody was saying like, we should all be on Blown Away. I just want to elaborate that what we do is lamp working. It's not what you see in uh, the Blown Away TV show. And we use this kind of material. We get like um tubing and rod of clear glass and there's a bench mounted torch that we use and this would be the colored glass that we'll use and then we that's all we get and then we use a torch in front of us to make these objects that you're about to see and you'll see a little bit of that in my slideshow so they call me coil condenser because i used to make coil condensers i was a scientific glass blower um for the beginning of my career i was Worked five years professionally, and this is me at one of the American Scientific Glass Blowing Symposiums in 2010, doing a demonstration on how to make coil condensers. So, using a, a hand towards I me. Mean, this is on glass lathe, but anyways, fast forward seven years, and now I'm making sculptural pipe. piece on the right the monkey in the blue um the blue uh geek or whatever uh, is actually on display at 100 dawn museum right now and thank you caitlin for inviting me and uh letting me display that piece on the show and i really appreciate it and um this whole series was made in 2017 and it's an ongoing series i've made two other pieces based on this and it's a study in form and how to position pieces, you know, it's like very hard to get this fluid motion in sculptural work, especially in glass, you know, there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of things that will, will happen anyways. So look at, they're fighting each other. That's pretty cool. Um, next, like sometimes I take inspiration from other things this is obviously Da Vinci, the Vitruvian monkey. Why do I make monkeys? Because it's always been my favorite animal. And that's what I wanted to start making when I first started sculpting. And obviously salt was a big inspiration for me to try to start sculpting in the beginning, which I've only been doing since like 2011, I think. Anyways, next slide. So we make pipes. They're, we call these Sherlock pipes. You know, why not make a monkey that's dressed as Sherlock Holmes? It's pretty cool. Sometimes I'll make stuff that I just think is cool. This is called Jumping Monkey. This was made years ago. It's probably that box is a foot wide, probably a foot tall, separate pieces in a diorama setting. And then I revisited that later on. Um, and this was called Monkey in the Bush. And the, those blades of grass are probably about like 12, 13 inches tall. A um, little close up on that guy. And what do monkeys think about? Who knows? Who knows what they think about? This piece was in the Coca show in Seattle. They did a show for us. Um, I forget what year it was way back in the day. But anyways, here's a little close up of the maybe thinking about humanity. Then like I take inspiration from my life. I spent five weeks in Costa Rica working at my buddy's shop down there. And I got inspired from just being living on the beach life and felt like a castaway. So I made this castaway monkey piece you know and this is two pieces that are both functional one is a rig and one is a dry piece and then sometimes i take inspiration just from cartoony images you know and like i wanted to make a grease monkey it's what a term for somebody that wrenches on cars all the time you know and um i looked it up online and there was a cartoon image and i tried to execute it as close as i could and spin it off of my own flavor and this is a 
piece as well. I made this in 2013. And then this is a piece that it's like, I call it the angel of death. And I've been wanting to make this piece for a while, but wings are extremely hard to make. So I end up scaling it down. It's probably maybe six inches tall, seven, but he's got glocks in his hand. He's positioned on the rocks, you know, and like that. I just make what I want and I think it looks cool. And then what do monkeys eat? They eat bananas. So I've had a whole other strew of work using banana motifs and stuff. And um, this is a set collaborated with Kiva Ford who works at the University of Notre Dame right now as their scientific glass blower. But we made this back in the day and uh, it was really cool. And then I think I made this set in uh, 2013, maybe 2015. Maybe it's 2015, actually, but uh, this is a set of peeling banana monies. These monies are this vinyl toy that Kid Robot makes, and it's a whole different story on my path of my career. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so if you look at these pieces together, it's supposed to evoke the that it's pe a peeling banana. You know, four pieces all in line. Um, I make collaborations with people. This is a banana motif, uh, AK-47, which has a banana clip on it. And this was made with Robert Mickelson, the world-renowned artist, and uh, that monkey's gunning for you right there. And then I also make collaborations, like half, 80% of my work is collaborations. So um, this piece I made with one of the panelists, Salt, um, who let me TA for him at Corning. And we didn't necessarily plan the entire thing, you know, but um, we call this Corning City Limits. And we experienced some uh, local flavor, if you will, when we were there. Like we would work in the studio and we'd go to this spot called Marconi's. I believe it was Marconi's, uh, sort of like a VFW. And we got to hang out with the locals there that are not involved with the glass scene at all. And they really don't like corning at all, but they still welcomed us. And we had a lot of fun hanging out with us, with, with them. And I don't know, took a little bit of inspiration from there. Anyways, sometimes we make pieces that we just want to make something cool or weird. And this is a collaboration with another panelist, Kim Thomas. Um, we made this back in the day. And why did we make it? Because it was weird. We thought it was cool. You know, it's like a little total recall, like flavor on the side there. And, you know, all these pieces are functional. This is another collaboration with my friend Worm. And we did this as like a, it's supposed to be a forced perspective. So he's got big hand, big foot, little hand, little foot, and he's leaning in. We call this the protector. He's got a little helmet on. He's ready to protect you. Um, <clears throat> sorry if I'm going too fast. I'm just trying to keep it in the time limit. Um, so I, all the collaboration I wanted to bring on to talk about the Molten Art Classic and my friend Adam Hubri, who's pictured here. So every year he brings together as many of these top pipe makers as he can just to try to make some crazy big piece, you know? And so this piece right here, uh, we call the Space Station. There's 25 artists involved on it, probably about 3000 man hours. The piece is four foot tall with that antenna and two foot wide and it weighs over 50 pounds and it's all lamp worked boro silicate glass. So um, it's a pretty big feat. And here's a little thing for scale. This is our friend Sagan, who's working on it. Um, and I think what Hoobs is doing <clears throat> with this Molinar Classic thing, it's just trying to push the boundaries of the medium and what's possible. And it's like, instead of having a competition like blown away or whatever it's like everybody's working together on one piece to try to just make something that like it would take you a year or two to make that by yourself you know it might not even be possible to make it by yourself so this was the last year in 2020 this is a molten art classic six six year and this piece is um 30 inches by 29 inches and those wheels are like nine inches tall and they're plasti coated you know like the plastic dip and they're all they all have bearings on them so this whole thing rolls and it's just like gigantic and um it's like the these like builds that hoops is doing like um are becoming more and more cohesive 
And I spent two weeks working on this, like nonstop, like 12 hour days. And um, anyways, next slide. <laughs> um, it's just really cool, you know? I'm like, so we wanted to get everybody's little flavor on there, but we didn't want to just make it look like a big, like everybody just like threw their stuff. So I had the idea to make it all monotone. So all these little panels, these are what these different 25 artists are like known for. You know, somebody makes Adventure Time, somebody makes skulls, somebody makes devils. Like you can see, I have a little banana down there, you know, and like, and then it kind of makes it more cohesive piece. And then this is the front grill that Kimberly Thomas, uh, Kim Thomas made. Um, yeah, she was also involved and, you know, I did the eyes, I did those spokes or whatever, but I mean, it was just a big collaborative project in general. So I thought it was really cool. And I thought that if you guys didn't know about <clears throat> the Molten Art Classic and Adam Hoover and what he's trying to do with these big builds that like, it should be on your guys' radar, you know, for Hunter Dunn or any museum that's interested in glass corning, you know, like these are, are these are insane pieces in person, you know, this is like, it's pretty, pretty intense. And so that leads me to like, where I just was, I was out in Huntington Beach working with Hoobs on this project and another project. And he's just assembling like, this was eight of the artists that he knew he could count on to make parts that would fit together. And these pieces took like two weeks. And so this piece has a separate chassis and, and all these little Simpsons characters are fitting in there. And this is it like cold and he makes this outer shell that he's just checking, but he has to like assemble them together when they're hot. So um, I made that little uh, crusty face back there. It's pretty cool, but um, yeah. And he's just trying to make these iconic cars and assemble these like calls them team builds you know and it's not for money it's not it's just for like the love of trying to make something cool and and i think it's pretty tight because any one of us it would take us months to try to even make this piece but because he assembles the right team and since hoobs is such a hard worker like it can be done in a couple weeks with everybody going i just wanted to show you guys this little uh video close-up of the amount of detail like look at this engine in here and it's got itchy and scratchy itchies group they're getting wrapped around the engine and you know so this is the end of my presentation this video is about like a minute long and looks like i'm kind of running over the time limit so but i don't know take it in i don't know if any simpsons fans are in there but this piece is really intense and we worked 12 to 14 hour days on it for a week and a half straight you know and this is the function right there. The crusty is the function. There's a joint right there that, um, and then the crusty leads up to the sideshow Bob on the top and his hair is the mouthpiece. So it's all hidden in there, but you know, thought it was pretty cool. So anyways, um, let me pass the buck to my good friend, Kim Thomas, who is an amazing sculptor, and I just can't wait to see what she has to show us. Thank you, Coyle. I really enjoyed your presentation. My name is Kim Thomas. Um, I um, wanted to give you a little background. First, I uh, graduated from Rhode Island School of Design. I, had a, I majored in ceramics, and then later I decided I wanted to be a makeup artist. So I moved to California. Um, I attended a makeup art school there and then got a job working for a special effects makeup artist named Kevin Haney, who won an Oscar for Driving Miss Daisy. Um, and then I got laid off from my job there and found flame working in a Craigslist ad. So I just sort of happened. Um, I didn't know anything about pipe making or even flame working. I had worked in the um, the hot shop with a friend at RISD like once. So the ceramics department was on the second floor and um, glass department was upstairs from there. So that was at all I knew about um, glass blowing. Okay, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I wanted to show this picture because uh, 
visually, it's a representa uh, representative of uh, the work that I do uh, sculpturally. Um, as far as uh, manipulating the glass, I like to um, change the surface so that it mimics you know, the texture and patina of old wood or fatigued metal. Um, and then this little disaster here is, uh, you know, I like uh, the, just the contrast between the, the blue sky and this, you know, and like an earthly kind of rugged look. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, this is, uh, I want to talk about the work that is in the museum. And this is uh, one of the pieces at the Hunter Den. Um, this is a cloud riding contraption, and this is part of a collection of my inventions. So besides being an artist and pipe maker, I'm an inventor and a storyteller. And this is part of a story about how you can, or one could build machines from, I don't know, stuff in your backyard or in your shed or all along the street and um, build these machines to escape earth or you know, go to different dimensions or different planets or just fly around in the sky. I mean, I often find myself looking at the sky and daydreaming and imagining how quiet it would be and how much fun it would be to just take off and have this um, really exciting adventure of traveling. And, you know, can't always do that, I guess, especially now. Anyway, this piece is, um, it's kinetic. So this uh, little uh, crank in the back, you would sit in the basket and you um, crank this, uh, you know, you turn the crank and that turns the propeller and then you can fly away. And then the bricks are, you know, hanging there in case you, you're getting too high. And, you know, you can, you can you know, use those to keep you from going off into the atmosphere. Or if you want to get really high, <laughs> you can drop them. <laughs> so um, this was the first piece that I, I made. And then once I made it, I was thinking, how am I going to get the clouds? You know, it was like, this is like a really good idea, but I have to collect clouds. Um, yes. <laughs> so um, next slide, please, Jason. So then I came up with an idea um, for the catching clouds. This is a cloud capturing apparatus. And so um, there's like a metal funnel and uh, you know you have to get closer to the sky in order to get the um, the clouds. So you know it's on a ladder. And I stacked. I I like the idea of stacking um, stuff. So there's a little crutch. And I feel like a lot of my work is maybe it's nicer in person. Like you can really see all of these fine details. So there's a little flip flop, um, a boot as a shim uh, for the ladder, and then a bunch of bricks and pieces of wood and everything. But the whole idea is that you, it might be a two person type of, uh, you know, activity, but you step on the bellows and they start to suck through this uh, tube, this or this hose that's connected to the funnel, and then it'll suck all of these clouds down in and they uh, get collected in the, the net, and then you take those clouds and um, and attach that to your cloud uh, writing contraption. So um, next slide, please. So this is another cloud writing contraption. And this one is more complicated than the first one. The first one, you know, was a, a pretty simple idea. I thought it's just like a fan and a basket. And it's really, um, you know, the solo, that's your solo mission. This one's a little bigger. So if you wanted to bring a friend or, you know, you didn't want to leave without your dog or I don't know, you wanted to bring a suitcase, it's a longer trip. This would probably be more of the size that you would want. But this one is also kinetic. 
And so the fan um, has a crank and that moves, but in order to start this machine, um, there's like a kick, there's a, a kick, um, a kickstart on the back, which is like a little, uh, you can't see it in this picture, but it's a hammer attached to a, a wheel. So you'd sit at the end, like kick the back of it and get that um, drive shaft movings and the little brooms in the front will start. And, you know, if you're coming in kind of hot, there's a couple of roller skates and a wheel on there for you to, you know, uh, land, or, you know, land like a plane. And then, you know, if you need to jump off or, or anything, or if you need your friend to push it while you just go on your own, or they can like run behind and jump on. Anyway, these are my uh, ideas and my inventions. And I, I had, I started like having a lot of other ideas about um, just different, you know, things that you would need if you were, you know, you know, adventure traveling. So, you know, I I'm have like, I have several pieces that are in the works and, um, you know, like a brainwave accelerator terminal. And then um, also I'm afraid of heights. So I would need, I thought of this um, anti-unconsciousness device, you know, and then <laughs> just a lot of like slightly ridiculous um, inventions, but uh, next slide, please. Oh, and then the underpants uh, parachute. So this would be for a, a quick getaway. You know, you can just rip off your underpants and jump. And then um, hopefully that would break your fall or like slow you down while you're jumping out of, uh, out of a window or off of a building, I guess. So um, yeah, so I mean, as I'm a pipe maker, but I don't always make pipes. And I feel like uh, sometimes my ideas don't really translate very well into pipes. So this is, uh, you know, my other, this is my escape to um, all of my other ideas and everything. So um, yeah, next slide, please. Ah, robots. So um, I started, I don't know, I really like robots for some reason. And um, also this kind of goes with the story of, uh, you know, my, the escape, which is, it's not just the sculpture. It is, um, it's going to have like a mixed genre text that goes along with it. So probably like, you know, an instruction manual and then some short stories. So I'm going to, besides being an inventor storyteller, I'm going to try to write a book too. Anyway, I like the idea of robots because um, I feel like we are uh, like robots and people are uh, programmable and reprogrammable. So, you know, you can, um, you can change your mind about certain things or just change your thinking, reinvent yourself, um, things like that. So this was the first uh, robot that I made and I named it Sweet Baby Robot. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. So this is uh, the second robot and this one is not a pipe. The first one was a pipe um, and then it has a little battery pack in the back and that's where the joint goes and then the eye was the mouthpiece. But this one, I just decided that I just like, uh, I don't know, didn't need to be a pipe. So um, part of the aesthetic that I have is that um, I, you know, I said that I wanted, I like to mimic the look of, you know, stone, wood, uh, old metal, rusty metal. And I do that by layering for it. Um, I add actual steel nails and then use, uh, you know, a lot of texture. Um, what else? And also making um, different like interfused, you know, cane glass to, you know, make, wood and then like bristles for brushes. These are all, it's not just like a one color of glass. It's, I striped many different colors. So like gray, black, you know, 
white to get that look, but you kind of have to look a little closely to see it. So, and um, this one is not kinetic. The last one was the broom and then his uh, arm moved, but this one has um, some, a stick with like a nail in it and then the chain um, that are, they come out of his head. And then these pieces around it, like the trash can, the, uh, the broom, uh, there's a mailbox too. Those are all um, part of it. So uh, next slide, please. And this is, um, it's not a very good picture, but I just finished this robot and I was really pleased with it. I think these are really funny and like kind of like pretty cute. So um, I make a lot of different pieces. So I'll make, you know, the paintbrush, the traffic cone, his like, you know, little uh, television wrenches. And I kind of have like a library of different parts. And then, um, you know, it's like if I had like, that's my workshop basically, or I go into my shed. Sometimes I like to imagine that I'm in this big junkyard and I just go around collecting pieces that I can use for robot parts and, you know, flying machines and cloud catching apparatuses and, you know, all of the different, um, you know, ideas that I have like volcano eruption uh, encouragement systems and things like that. So part of, you know, I kind of have an idea of what I want and then I'll say, okay, a gas can goes here, television goes here and kind of piece them together. So this one is, um, it's a pipe, the uh, traffic cone arm is the joint and then he just has a little hole in the back of his head um, for the mouthpiece and his wrench arm moves and then his stick or boot on a stick leg and then uh, crutch with a, a flip-flop, um, they all also move. They have little joints um, attached to where the television is. Um, next slide, please. And here also, or this is, um, you know, all of these pipes are inspired obviously by the, uh, the escape project. So this is a boot and then like a layering frit with rod glass um, to get this uh, kind of weathered, dirty old boot look. And then obviously heavy carving and then, um, yeah, that's it. So this is a pipe also. And then the mouthpiece is in the front of the boot and then the bowl is where you would stick your foot. Next slide, please. And mailboxes I think are um, a good, they make a really good hammer. Like some shapes of things, you know, I tried to like figure out a good, you know, I don't always want it to look like a pipe. You know, like my work is mainly about sculpture and um, you know, texture form, you know. So trying to figure out a clever way, uh, you know, uh, to not necessarily hide that it's a pipe, but, you know, just a, like a shape that flows with a, you know, with a shape of, you know, a traditional pipe, like a hammer. So if you sit these up with the front of the mailbox downward and um, it's, a, it's a hammer shape. So also I like, um, just as a side note, um, I was backing up from my <laughs> neighbor in my neighbor's driveway and I backed into their, their mailbox and I knocked it over. And I like, I still think about that. <laughs> so it's like, you know, a rusty old mail. I picked it back up and put it back in, but it was like, oh, just, you know, mailboxes. Anyway, next slide. Um, suitcases, obviously you would need those for your trip in your cloud uh, writing uh, contraption and, you know, dirty old suitcases. And, you know, those are the kind of things that you see on the street. I live in Detroit and there's always, you know, really good junk laying around to the, for inspiration. And, okay, go ahead, next, this is good. Trash cans. Um, yeah, so these are all one piece of glass too. Um, try to make it, uh, I don't know, simplify forms in a lot of ways. So I would take 
one piece of glass and push, you know, certain areas in and pull certain areas and then add glass and then obviously texturize and, um, you know, just so, because like certain, I feel like pipes, they shouldn't have, like, shouldn't always have too many parts because they'd be easy to break off. So simplifying the way you make a piece, um, uh, I think is important as far as making a very functional uh, pipe, um, but still having those really sculptural aspects. Um, next, please. And spray cans. Um, this is another, you know, I think uh, um, pipe making and graffiti or, you know, it has like a, um, a connection. So I was thinking about making these uh, dirty old, you know, bent up uh, spray cans, you know, something you'd find in an alley, which, uh, you know, I'm in Philly, uh, where I used to live. We had an alley where everybody spray painted. So this is a little reminiscent of my Philly time. Next, please. And a uh, gas can. So this one is a rig, a um, water pipe, I guess. And the nozzle is the mouthpiece and in the back where I guess you would fill the um, gas is the joint. So um, again, with the uh, highly textured, old, uh, fatigued metal kind of look and um, just layers and layers of frit and uh, carving. And um, I was like, I really liked this piece and I hadn't actually made um, a rig in a while. So um, I feel like this one turned out really well. Um, go ahead, next one, please. And this is kind of a grouping. I feel like they look better in a group as opposed to just uh, alone. But this is, um, you know, just kind of how my work all looks together. So thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce Joseph. He is next. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And thank you again, Jason, for inviting me to take part in this impressive symposium. It is not often that one is invited to share more experimental scholarship um, in progress with a large audience. So again, my thanks. I'm going to um, black out my screen so we can just focus on the images and objects I'm going to show you, and I won't distract you with my excellent jean jacket. It is now my pleasure to introduce Susie Silver. Howdy, y'all. Um, thank you, Joseph, for that um, that beautiful meditation. Thank you to um, Kim and Salt and Coyle for um, taking us through your artwork and to Jason for um, your introduction and to the whole Hunterton Museum um, for having this event. And like, lest we forget to Caitlin um, Vitalo for curating this really incredible show and bringing glass to the people and glass in its fullest compliment. So um, I am so thankful to be here with you speaking from the Corning Museum of Glass. Um, now we all talked about the Corning Museum of Glass so we can have that sense. I'm gonna show you some pictures in a little bit, but I, um, after seeing so much great work, I thought that something, um, something I should do first is just um, maybe bring us back. You know, we've been to so many different places. So I wanna just bring us to this moment and um, remind us that in these presentations today, we had Salt talk to us about the importance of the haptic, the importance of touch and sound and probably smell, although he didn't mention that. You know, the importance of the embodied embodied body, the embodied experience of being with a thing. And that's also what Jason was speaking uh, about at the beginning. So I wanna remember that the pipe, which is what brings us here now is something that connects us with our body and also as Salt said, with our breath. Um, and that 
makes this form a really interesting form that acts like no other art form, at least not that I'm aware of, um, but brings it in line with um, many of the kinds of utilitarian objects that we um, that that have been elevated to art forms and are this in incredible exploration that we use every day, mugs, goblets, all kinds of things, the things that we engage our body and our minds with. And from Coil, we learned about, we learned so many things from Coil, we, but we learned about um, how important this medium is, how open this medium is to a range of different influences and how it brings in aspects of popular culture and then it contributes back out to popular culture. And that is a really incredibly important aspect of this field and of this material and of this form, that it can speak to so many different people in so many different ways, that it can take in um, take in things that for most of us, you know, you sit and you watch The Simpsons and maybe you talk about The Simpsons and maybe The Simpsons form some part of the way that you think, but here it's an art form where you take that in and can give it out. And that is a, a really interesting thing. Then it brings it into, into, the, into the world, into life, into the body and connects with other people. And from Kim, from Kim, we learned about about kinetic sculpture. So not just about the functional object, the functional object that is kinetic in your use of it, that you bring it from, from place to place and from person to person, from your mouth to your hands, but that also you're working in a material that can have, that can have connections, that can articulate things, that can be used to make ideas real, that can give a physical expression to her inventions and ideas. Um, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. And that this material of pipes, that the flame working that lets it happen, the community that collects and uses these, the, the incredible community of artists that makes them, um, is a place where people that have diverse interests, people that come from a ceramic background, people that studied at RISD, people that didn't study, um, in a formalized setting can find an outlet for their work. That this is a spot where it makes, the first time I ever heard Kim talk about the fact that she had a background in, um, in makeup um, in, and in, in special effects, I said, oh, and that makes so much sense. And isn't it incredible that you have found an art form where you can take that experience and you can bring it right into the object and you can layer powders. What Kim was showing us, the things that made her work look so old and dented and so convincing is this understanding of how the powder works, which is not that different than what you would put on your face. So it is an incredible thing what these three artists that are three of such a huge community is an incredible thing what they have shown us. Um, the way that this, uh, this field, which is, you know, to remind us of the, the reason for the season, the title of this, understudied art. Um, it, it brings so many things in, into it and it works for so many people. And so with that as, a, you know, a, a, a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a beginning, I am going to show you some, I'm going to show you some images, but what I'm giving you is just like a beginning, y'all because we've heard so much and there is so much to hear and know and we can't get to the whole place. Um, so I'm gonna share, let's see how well it works. I hope it works pretty well. There, there we go. Um, so here is where I'm speaking to you from, the Corning Museum of Glass. And, and here is um, the very first glass cannabis pipe ever accessioned by any museum that was um, added to the collection in 2019, a work by Dave Colton, who we may be lucky enough to have on this call right now. Dave, if you're here, thank you. Um, thank you again for this incredible work that I get to see every day and that I, I get to find joy in every day. Um, I appreciate, I appreciate you and I appreciate this work. And this work, like so many of the other works that we have seen tonight, um, 
participates in, in the camouflage. I think it was Salt that first talked about camouflage and how important that is to the field and to his, and to his work. And Kim showed us that and Coyle showed us that too. And that is because this is an art form that is now seeing the light, but for so long um, had to exist in a totally underground space. Now the objects can be in, in space in more places in a way that is accepted. And yet, the artists still find themselves so much of the time not able to be the people that they fully are, um, aren't able to express themselves verbally in the way that their work can express itself. And this piece by Dave Colton um, shows some of those same impulses. And so what it looks like is a thicket of beautiful calligraphy, um, graffiti inspired and uh, with the rhythm of music um, behind this. To, to use it, you would have to take it apart, but behind that is a small piece that is functional that you can, nobody said it, I will say it, smoke out of. Um, it, it's there, it's all encoded in the object, but the object holds so much more than just that, the same way that all of the work, that all of all of everyone has showed us, um, the bowl that Joseph showed us, and each one of these pipes holds so much more within it. So where did this where did this um, art form come from? You know, the story is usually, um, the story that gets recited is that in the um, mid to late 90s, Bob Snodgrass, um, who was one of the first pipe makers, and here you see him holding one of his pipes, um, brought this, brought this art form, the art form that had grown up in the Grateful Dead parking lots. Um, you see here, had infiltrated out into the country, into college campuses, into high school campuses. Don't tell anybody, but that's where I first became aware of the pipe maker's art. Um, because the Grateful Dead stopped touring in that year, Jerry Garcia died. And, um, and people were so enamored of these pipes um, in particular, there were so many things. What we had, what I was thinking of when Joseph showed us that bowl, this cut to clear that he's talking about transparency and he's talking about brilliance. And I was thinking to myself, oh, what we saw, what we saw from Kim, what we saw from Coil, what we saw from Salt were all highly colored objects. And in part, that's because of the ideas that they are bringing to us. But that is also because the, that is part of the pipe maker's art the pipe makers brought color to this notoriously color resistant glass, porous silicate. And so in the beginning, in the Bob Snodgrass and early others days, those colors didn't exist and they didn't exist in the same way. And instead you had a clear glass that you could fume with a little bit of silver or gold. And then that pipe would transform as if in collaboration with its users from something that is um, light colored to something that had these really um, deep and interesting, um, interesting um, colors. So it was an object that you used, that, that, that you looked at and that changed and transformed and grew along with you. So, okay, that's the like origin story. I feel like that's like, oh, we need to recite that um, every single time. But just to briefly, briefly, I want to take it back. We've had, you know, two historical sort of examples, so let's give a little bit more. I want to take it all the way back to the Meerschaum pipe. The Meerschaum pipe, which from the beginning of the 1700s, about 1723, became the it material for tobacco pipes in the same way that glass now is the it material for cannabis pipes. Um, everybody wanted it. Why did everybody want it? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, it could be carved into these incredible and fantastical forms, similar to the ones that are preferred by many of the pipe makers today. It al allowed that kind of specificity. And, and the, the, the fantastical shapes and forms that people would carve into it, they reflect the culture and the cultural moment of that time which the context of these pipes, which were made in Vienna from Meerschaum, which is a specific mineral um, that is found mostly in Turkey. So thing made, found in Turkey, brought to Vienna, carved to use to smoke tobacco, which was an exotic material. And so the objects, the forms themselves encode the colonialist and racist um, notions, but also the 
the the an orientalist but but also trying to grasp a world that is beyond their reach through the personal object of a pipe and i think that that there's something really aligned in that um in that historical exploration and what pipe makers are doing now so you can see some of this um some of this uh, kind of orientalist um patterning but also interesting formal use Here's the thing about meerschaum. They liked it because they could carve it. They liked it because it provided a good smoking experience. It made, it's a porous stone. And so it made the tobacco more flavorful and it, um, huh, not really a smoker, you guys. So this is a little like beyond my, um, this one is a little bit beyond me here, but it, 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 it made for a pleasurable experience. It was very dry, but meerschaum, like the early glass pipes, is also a material that transforms along with its user. So you can see here how it's this amber color, this kind of patina. And, and that is in part because this is an old thing. This is a thing, this one is from the 1800s. It's old, but that's not why it has that color. It has that color, and look, also speaking of sculpting, it has that color because because it has been used. This one, this light colored meerschaum is what the material looks like when you first get it. So like a color change pipe before you've smoked out of it. And then as you smoke out of it, that porous, that porous stone pulls the tar into the cracks and gives it this um, patinated look, which is the reason that people liked it. And this, this dominated pipe making for a hundred years. And who knows how long the glass will dominate, um, will dominate glass pipe making. So I wanted to give you that little bit of historical context, but I want to tell you just a few other things. And then I know we need to open this one up. I'm at 12 minutes, you guys, it's gonna be one more minute. Um, the other things that are important to just say out loud are important to this particular art form and are a gift of the pipe makers to all the rest of us is this notion of collaboration. There is no other art form actually in which collaboration is as highly valued as it is within, within pipe making. And that is interesting to come from a mainstream art making uh, background where the, the artist is valued, the individual is valued above the collective. This is an interesting model that should be explored more. And the pipe makers have made better use for longer of the internet as a vehicle for getting out their message about what they're doing than anybody else of all time. In fact, actually all this news about NFTs this week and about, um, about uh, the internet and artwork, I'm like, oh, the pipe makers had that and they had that almost 20 years ago. So I'm gonna stop talking now because hopefully y'all have some questions and other people have some things to say, but I just wanna say in closing again, that it is such a gift to be here, that it is such a gift every day. You know, I've been at this museum for five years and I've been writing about pipes for maybe seven, but I first had the idea of doing a show about pipes in 2000 because I saw, oh, here's the thing. Oh, this is my last point. Oh, this is my last point. In case there's anybody in the audience that still thinks, why should we pay attention to pipes? Like, is this important? Yes, my friends, it is important because this is a material that touches so many people. This is a community that is probably bigger than any other art, uh, art affiliate community. This is a community of engaged people that are saying something and they come from all different backgrounds, maybe not all different backgrounds, but, but some some different backgrounds <laughs> and they, their work touches people and it touches people in a way that those of us in a more mainstream um, art making community could really learn from. And so with that, I'm done. Thank you. Um, that was fabulous and invigorating and inspiring and thank you so much. Um, was it Salt or Coil or Kim? Somebody said that uh, that was beautiful preaching and, and um, I agree. And I think that's a very high compliment, well-deserved. And, and in a way, all of you um, were the preachers today, I think um, leading us through the, 
the beauty of these various art forms um, from the pipe to the bowl. Now is the time to have a, a more fluid discussion and open it up. Um, so, but before we do, I think it's really important um, to hand the mic as it were over to Caitlin for um, just a brief moment. Um, I wanted Caitlin to have to give a presentation in this, but um, Caitlin's very busy, but um, we're, we're graced, I think, by these couple minutes in which, Caitlin, you will, you will um, tell us about the show at the Hunter and Art Museum, Glass in the Expanded Field. Yeah, yeah, can everyone hear me? Okay, well, um, so thank you everybody for, for coming to this and for all of those presentations. And Susie, I wish I had your like energy right now, but just pretend I do. Um, so the, the exhibition Glass in the Expanded Field, if you haven't seen it yet, it is currently on our website in a virtual format. So please go to our website and check it out so you can walk through the galleries and hear all the artists talking about their pieces. It's a really great show, I think. Um, basically, Glass in the Expanded Field um, is kind of exploring this growing field of glass and all of the changes that this community is going through and how many different groups of people are accessing this material. So this exhibition covers, you know, blown glass and cast glass and pieces that don't even have glass in it at all. Some that are performance and pipes and kinetic pieces. So it's really thinking about what this material is, questioning uh, our maybe preconceived ideas about what we think glass art is versus what it could be. And also um, really just embracing the attitude of glass making and everything about the material and how it works. It is a material that's kind of contradictory and opposite. It's hot and it's cold, it's transparent, it's opaque, um, and a, a whole other mess of, of words that are contradictory, but it's kind of embracing the opposites rather than being at odds with each other. These opposites complement each other, um, which is something you see in a lot of the pieces in the show. You know, we've got Dan's Kung Fu Monkey, which is this kind of you know, a, adult pipe that is paired with this childhood nostalgia for the toy and, you know, Kim's like fun, like playful installation pieces that kind of harbor this uh, you know, darker aspects of human existence and needing to escape. Um, so that's just a brief little blurb about the exhibition. I hope that kind of draws you in to come check it out, see it in person before it closes or see it online. And uh, I guess we'll, are we opening it up for a discussion, for talks and questions? I feel like that was such a, I feel like people must have things to ask. Yeah. Yes, I thank you so much, Caitlin, and um, congratulations again on the exhibition. And I also encourage people to see it if possible safely in person. But yes, I think in it, we've gone over already, but I think we we will we should take at least ten minutes. Um, I don't think we will have time to take questions from the audience because of the time limit. Um, uh, but I think it would be really great to have a brief dialogue among the artists, among Susie, Joseph, Caitlin. Um, so I think it would be a, a rich way to learn more about pipes, um, before we depart. So, um, I don't, I don't need to start with the framing question, but maybe uh, there's various threads that kind of have emerged today. Um, one of them that I'm really str uh, struck by is, um, relationship, um, the intimate relationship of father and son, for example, but also the relationship, sometimes intimate relationship of friendship and the uh, production of pipes that is collaborative. And I'm just, I guess I'm wondering about how relationships, how the tenderness, care, vulnerability of relationships might get into the form of some of these works. which is my way of saying talk, and I'm gonna now go away. <laughs> so tell me. I didn't try to answer that. Um, so I, that's a great point. And I think what Susie said about collaboration 
really kind of frames that. Um, I, and I think that in general, pipe making as an art form, because it has been sort of grown up in its own little microcosm, separate from uh, other forms of fine art and separate from maybe the scrutiny that comes along with that, that we have sort of uh, made our own set of rules or lack of rules. Um, and so collaboration is something that it just kind of makes sense to us. And for me, collaborating with other artists is sort of the most intense way that I can bond with someone. Like not only am I get to, I mean, even everyone in this panel I met through my art in one way or another, through glass, through pipes. And so when I get to make something with someone, it's, there's this physical object that like solidifies that relationship and you get to, you spend such an intense time with them um, that you, you end up talking about things that are frivolous and sort of normal conversational. Um, what, what music do you like? What, you know, what books have you read? What are your other, you know, your family situation? Like these things come up naturally because of the time that is spent, but also your problem solving together, your, meshing styles, you're using creativity in, in a, you know, you have to cooperate. Um, and it's just such a celebration of, of those relationships. And, and then you end up with this object at the end. And for a lot of us, we also get to make money at the end. Is this it's such a tangible sort of like, you know, success thing to, to, to like put a period on the end of that sentence. And I think that because of, again, like pipe making growing up in its own little microcosm, separate from these other rules that we're sort of not even aware, you know, that some of these things that are, are taught as like, this is the step A, step B, uh, this is the way that you talk about work that we've come up, we've come up with our own things out of necessity, and that maybe it allows for a certain level of inclusivity for the people who are viewing the work, who are collecting the work, um, that they feel like the art is more approachable. Uh, I mean, I, I get that sense, like in my travel, like I've talked to a lot of people where my art or my contemporaries art has been sort of an entry point into art in general, you know, that they sort of feel that this is an art that they can uh, begin with um, and it leads to these other places. And so, uh, I think that the relationships are probably the most profound thing uh, personally for me, like the different connections that I've made and even the work itself. Like I've come to this point where I feel like the true artwork of salt glass is this vast network of people who touch these objects daily and share them with other people. And that it sort of feeds this energy back to me in the form of money, but also in different kinds of feedback and, and, and I just knowing that those people are out there having those experiences is sort of makes me, it's, it's, it's hard to describe like the depth of feeling that comes with that to know that I'm like, can be a part of somebody's ritual and part of their day and hopefully a positive part of that day. Um, that it, I guess what I'm saying is that there was a time in the beginning for me that I felt like pipes were held separate. And I felt like a sense of loss or of being excluded from something because uh, the pipe was not viewed like other art. And I've come to this point now where I realize that that has been an asset to us. And that it has given us permission to do things that maybe other art forms aren't as readily sort of handing out. Um, yeah, and well, I just, just for time salt, um, because I think that's a really interesting point. No, no, no. Um, and we can talk about this on the phone later too. That's, I think you made really, really good points. And I, one of the things I'm wondering about, are, I, I'd love to hear about the social from other people as well, but about this um, idea of, um, of uh, ritual and um, how these objects are used in, um, and, and, and this goes to the cut glass bowl, but it also goes to almost all of the pipes that we saw today that they, um, they're they exquisite and specific and like you're not taking that, you know, in your purse or briefcase, you know, around like you, <laughs> you might need a stand and you might need to like really attend to the object and respect it and its fragility. But anyways, yeah, Susie, Kim, Caitlin, 
Joseph, any, please jump in. Um, I think that I, what I like about, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, the, the collaboration aspect of pipe making and, um, you know, it's like more like we're working together. There's also, um, uh, an event called uh, Michigan Glass Project. So that's another um, event where, you know, glass blowers or pipe makers come together to work together, um, do a, a large co uh, collaboration project. But we also um, are raising money to get uh, art classes back in the schools into Detroit. So and I feel like a lot of the um, those type of events, like the Molten Art Classic, which I've done for six years also, it's more about the experience and coming together to work together and make something um, beautiful. I mean, I, you know, we do end up making money, but, you know, money shouldn't drive everything that you do as an artist and as a philanthropist. And, you know, there should be... Um, like the experience, the experience of working with someone and getting to know them and, um, you know, becoming friends and understanding the working style. And like uh, Lucan said, problem solving together, because that is a huge part of um, making a, a pipe or making some kind of artwork and kind of discussing these, uh, you know, your process and everything. And like, once you, you know, work that out, um, you know, it's like you could have not really met somebody or know them only a little bit and said, oh, I really like your work. Why don't you come to my studio, which is actually how Coil and I um, really got to know each other better was I was like, come to Texas because I lived out there. And then he just like called and was like, yeah, I want to come out. And now we're like best friends. So, um, you know, another, you know, that happens with uh, a lot of artists, you know, and uh, I mean, we do a lot of like the whole mail collaboration thing where somebody sends a piece. I don't really like that. I, if I do a collaboration, I want to work with the person in the same room so we can really discuss and talk and have, you know, a true collaborative piece. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I can talk a little bit about the um, collector's point of view, like how um, maybe not necessarily I'll bond with every collector, but um, these collectors, they'll, they'll pack the piece in a little pelican case and they'll fly across the country to go hang out with their other friends and they'll unpack it and it's like sort of a ritualistic thing and um, they want everybody to hit it and to like these objects just become like like more sentimental to them you know what i'm saying like it's like they share them with their friends they get passed around and they're they're bringing them on the airplanes with them and and traveling to different events and maybe um that's another way that people bond over the pipe work not necessarily like you know i mean whenever i see a collector that brings a piece to wherever i'm at i always want to try to hold it or hit it or you know I respect that they took the effort to bring it out of their home and bring it to this event because glass is fragile and you know like it could get bumped off the table and everybody's very careful with these pieces but I don't know that's just another aspect of the the collector aspect and me myself you know like I collect the glass works too and sometimes I want to bring Rob jump in well, yeah. uh, Quest frozen. Um, yeah. I, I think thinking He's about on the wall there. Um, go ahead, Susie. Thinking about how think thinking about how these objects enter into the world. You know, thinking about the role of collecting and how collectors operate. I mean, for me, one of the most exciting things about um, the because I'm a glass dork, total glass dork, about the um, pipe making field is the way that um, pipe collectors would speak about their objects in exactly the same way as more mainstream studio glass collectors, maybe from the 90s in particular, 
and Aiden would talk about the work. So an emphasis on technique and really understanding all the, all the different colors. And, um, and certainly in um, mainstream glass, there's a kind of ritualized aspect to the co collectors, more ritualized than in other art forms. So the collectors form groups and they travel to each other's houses because you can't bring it all with you. But it is a really interesting thing um, and understudied right for study um, to think about the way that the um, collectors of these artworks interact with each other and with the work. That's, that's, that's beautiful. Um, and, uh, and I think I, I'm, I'm so eager to ask another question, which is about counterculture and um, the transgressive potential of these objects, which unfortunately we just are not gonna be able to get to. Um, but uh, I'm wondering, Caitlin, not to put you on the spot, but as the curator of the exhibition, um, you know, you've done the heavy lifting here. I'd love for you to have the last word. Okay, um, great. Well, yeah, this was just such an enlightening panel just to think about, you know, touching on what you just brought up, Jason, of, you know, counterculture and subculture and thinking about like the history of glass making and how, how just glass moved out of the, the production studio and into an artistic sphere and the kind of the chaos that came with the moving out of that field into becoming an, an art form and the refusal of glass art to only be decorative and functional, but rather to have this depth to it that, um, you know, we've seen in all of these pieces today, you know, just thinking about the that dagger that Salt showed and, um, yeah, that there's just, I don't know, so much depth to all of this. And I think it's really important to, to kind of consider these subcultures and how um, they're just, they're no longer subcultures. They're, they're kind of all coming, coming to a head and, and thinking about, um, you know, what glass art is and who is a glass artist and how, how that's identified and yeah, I feel like I'm just kind of talking in circles because I've just been so taken in with all of this um, information from today. It was really amazing to learn about all of your work and hear more about pipe making and, and just the, the culture and the process and these like amazing pieces that have so much depth to them beyond their, their function. A great encapsulation of everything we've learned. And I just wanted to say that um, I think it was, I could have been Dan, but um, I think it would make a fantastic episode of Blown Away. <laughs> I just want to say that. And um, I think that this um, symposium, you know, shows the, um, the richness of this topic and this should not be the last. And, you know, hopefully there will be more. Susie, Joseph, everyone, you know, um, we'll do our preaching and thanks to the audience and the museum for hosting the event tonight.